Hello and welcome to our webinar, Layer Process Audits 101. I'm your host, Rachel Perdon, Marketing Director for Beacon Quality, a mobile auditing software. And today I'm very excited to be joined with over 400 of you, as well as Murray Sitsamar of the Luminous Group, who will be walking you through the basics of layer process audits, as well as how to construct quality questions uh, and creating that culture of quality. As Murray presents, and you want to ask a question, um, you can just use the panel in your GoToWebinar uh, system that you logged into. Simply type that question into the question section, uh, and then towards the end of the presentation, I will read them aloud to Murray so he can answer them. So a quick intro of Murray. Uh, we asked Murray to be our speaker here today because he has a great reputation in helping hundreds of companies become more efficient and effective. As some of you may already know, Murray was the AIAG committee leader for development of the CQI8 second edition industry reference document, the layer process audit guidelines. So he literally helped write the, write the guidelines for LPAs. Plus, Murray was part of the team that helped the big a big three automotive OEM fine tune their guidelines to help uh, FMEAs, which is accredited with over 20% reduction in warranty costs. And with this leadership, the Luminous Group was selected by a well known tier one supplier in the aerospace industry to provide workshops for advanced product quality planning, or also known as APQP. And he also partnered with an automotive OEM to roll out the layer process audit strategy in their North American suppliers. So we are very happy to have you here today, Murray. Um, and I believe you wanted to conduct a, a few quick surveys to help us to know a little bit more about our audience. Right, so yeah, Rachel, thanks so much for the, uh, for the great welcome. That's very flattering. Um, yeah, if you could go with the, the polling questions, then we could learn a little bit more about the audience and tailor today's webinar to uh, kind of where they are. Absolutely. So you will see on your screen here in just a second a poll. You just simply select which one best represents you. And we're just going to have a few seconds here. So just click on which one is best suits you, and, and then I'll share the results. So about 60% of you have voted. I'll give it a few more seconds here. Yeah, this question is good to see kind of a baseline of uh, where people are in their learning curve with LPA. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm just going to three, two, one. Okay. I'm going to close that out and share the results with all of you. So about 60% or 56% uh, is just learning about it now. Uh, the next runner up here is it's working, but we're not seeing the results. And 2% of you that's have perfected know. LPA, so that's awesome. All right, so I'm going to launch the second uh, poll here, which is how do you schedule and conduct layer process audits? So again, just a few seconds to review. So there's paper-based systems, Excel and printouts, using a software package, uh, or but it's still not, or maybe you're still printing it out, and then using a mobile auditing software. Great. So this question will help us understand, again, kind of in the life cycle, but most people are going to start off with a, a paper-based system or some um, spreadsheets that you print out as your checklist, and then eventually say, hey, there's a lot of paperwork here. How do we evolve into um, an electronic tool? And of course, participants, you know, that's why Ease Beacon is interested in hearing where you are and sponsoring this webinar. Okay, just a couple of seconds. Um, about 72% of you have voted. And three, two, one. All right, let's see what we have here, so 43% uh, of you are using Excel and printouts, and 26% of you are using some sort of paper-based system, and then about 
15, 16% are using some sort of software. Great. That doesn't surprise me too much, but I thought maybe uh, less than 26% would just be paper-based. But um, it's great. It's a great way to start. Yeah, yeah. and great our result. last poll uh, is what was the strongest motivation in implementing or learning about uh, layer process audit? So last one here, and it's just three options. Right. Here we want to find out if you're doing it because your customer said you need to. That's the first choice, non-negotiable from the customer. Uh, the second choice, that you have an operating system that you're using, LPAs or some type of verification to hold things in place. And the third one is uh, that leadership understands it and is using it as a tool to drive excellence in everything you do. Great. So about 60% of you have voted. I'll, I'll give you a few more seconds. And then I'll let Murray take it away. And three, two, one, and there we go. So about 35% 35. 35 of you, mm -hmm. non-negotiable yeah, customer requirement. Hmm. Kind of like a third, a third, a third. Yeah. Very All good. Right, I'm glad so. to see that 29%. That's a good. That's a good start. We'll try to get that number higher over the next couple of years. Yeah. Well, Murray, I'm going to go ahead and hide this and change presenters to you, so you can take it away and share with us layer process audit basics. Okay, great. Thanks, Rachel. I really appreciate it. Great. So this is our agenda for today. Um, simple, right? We only have about 45 minutes. We'll take some questions and answers at the end. So I'm going to keep it simple. Step one, step two, step three. And this is a progression, how people might be using layered audits. First one, verification. Are you verifying standards and um, policies, parameters? Step two, are you engaging the workforce? partially in quality, but also in the work that they need to do. Are your LPA auditors, are they engaged in the value of doing LPA? And then step three deals with the culture of quality and driving excellence in everything that you do. So from the, the polling questions, um, I see many of you are kind of on the path, some of you are, are new to LPA. If you're an organization that produces a product or service, which all of you are, there's three things that you kind of need to do. The first one is find the best way to provide or produce that product or that service, right? Find the best way. Companies do pretty good with that. Second thing you need to do is you have to hold it in place. And that's a challenge, right? Especially in mass manufacturing in this day and age where you have changes in new people and new positions because of the economy. It's hard to hold best practices in place. So we want to improve that. And the third thing you need to do after you find the best way and hold it in place is always look for improvement, right? How can we drive improvement? So this presentation is about how to take your game up to the next level. My goal in the next 30, 40 minutes is to help you see layered process audits in a new light and give you some momentum in moving forward to, uh, to make LPA, if that's what you're doing, uh, not just another thing to manage, but a way to give you momentum forward. So step one is uh, about verification. In fact, for those of you that have, may have heard me talk before or uh, have a chance to read anything that I wrote about layered audits, I'm kind of on a mission to change the name from layered process audit to layered process verification. Those are three words that make a lot of sense, right? So layers of management are doing these periodic checks. You're checking the process. You're not checking the system. You're not checking the product. You're checking the process at a point in time. And what you're checking is a verification of what already exists. Right? You're not necessarily trying to find problems, which is the tone of an audit. Um, you're trying to verify what should be done is being done on a risk-based basis, so not everything but the things that are most important or most susceptible to change. The word audit also might make you think of a tax audit or accounting audit or a 
legal audit, and those are painful. So we don't want to introduce pain. I like the word verification. In step one, the first level of thinking about a layered process verification is, is the operation or the activity conforming to requirements. So in a work cell, in a department, at a person's desk, wherever the activity is taking place, you want to see that it's conforming to the requirements. And requirements, I think many of you will know, might be in standardized work instructions. It might be in protocols. It might be in setup parameters or other types of settings. Those were established so that the work to be done in a safe fashion, to be done effectively, could be done efficiently, and lead to continuous improvement. If you don't have a baseline, if you don't have your standards in place, it's hard to figure out what to change in order to obtain improvement. From that first step of verification, we want to leverage what's most important. We don't have time in our data to check everything, so we have to do a risk-based prioritization of what we want to check. But looking at the process, this should be done not by uh, the quality department, that makes it feel like it's an audit again, someone else is checking my work, but it should be done by a one of my, my peers, you know, another team member, a supervisor, a manager, someone that might be accountable for the work that I do. This is the first learning tip is, if your quality department is the only folks that are doing your LPAs, rethink that. It's gonna be a lot of resistance to that. We're gonna check the inputs, we're gonna to check to make sure they're current, and again, most critical parameters, elements for that particular task. And the good news is, even if you need to do LPAs for your customers, you decide what's most important. So you have the first chance to decide. Of course, if a problem leaks through, your customer is gonna ask you to get to the surface cause of that, the root cause, and hold the improvement in place. But for the most part, you decide what's most critical. In other words, you can decide how to most make LPAs most effective for your organization. The questions really matter a lot. Um, I found this a lot when people were rolling out layered process audits seven, 10 years ago, and we were involved with a, a major OEM here in the Detroit area, and uh, people felt pressure, time pressure to implement layered audits, did not give a lot of thought to the questions, and yet those questions were asked over and over again, right? Every day, every shift, maybe five days a week, maybe six days a week, month after month. If you don't invest the time up front to write good questions, that's another failure mode in your, your LPA. Right? Good questions take some effort. They need to be very specific. They need to be objective. In other words, you could answer it yes or no. It's not I feel, I think, I hope, I, I assume. You can look at the evidence, understand from the question what you're looking for, and then determine whether you're conforming or not conforming. Right? When you have a list of questions, you could determine whether or not they could be leveraged across the organization, but don't view that as the main priority. Uh, I don't like to see generic questions because then they don't get to the heart of the risk for the specific work cell. If you do similar manufacturing on several lines or across several plants, you might develop a bank of questions. And some of the software tools that are out there, like Beacon Quality Software, has a great library question feature where you could tag questions and pull them up so that you can look at your current best practice when you're writing checklists. So beware. Do not use generic questions. Focus on the specific requirement that is at risk. Don't look at general things. Those are two very important things. So let me repeat those. Don't use generic questions and focus on specific elements of the, the work or the task that's most at risk. Sometimes I'm quite amused when I see um, clients or protect, prospective clients LPA check sheets and the things that they're asking is almost like cut and paste, uh, unfortunately, from, from bad examples. Questions that don't help don't get to the crux of the matter related to that job 
at the very moment, the very minute or second that you're looking at it. So for one of the questions that amuses me is, uh, is the operator following the job instruction? And it sounds like a great question, right? We want the answer to be yes, but if I'm, an, if I'm a, a verifier from another department, for me to answer that question, I've got to learn that job. I've got to study that job instruction. That might take a while. And everything in that job instruction, whether it's a, a 10 cycle or task or a, a, a two minute cycle task, they're probably not all equally at risk. So within the work instruction, I'd rather dig to the one or two or three or four if the high risk element and ask about those things, see if I could observe those settings, parameters, protocols, et cetera. Um, are quality alerts posted? Not a good question, right? You think you want the answer to be yes, but what's more important to me is, is the operator or the team member, the person performing the work, not only aware of the quality alert, but are they following it at this moment in time? Is the gauge calibrated? Boy, what an easy question to write, right? Easy thing to check. But if I'm doing these audits every shift every day, if that gauge was calibrated yesterday, probably gonna be still calibrated today. Might not, right? But that's a system check. That's a system looking at your, your gauge calibration, your measurement systems, not appropriate for uh, a layer process verification that you're doing on an ongoing regular basis. So one of the last two questions, does the operator know the quality policy? That's nice that they know it, but I wanna say, are they following the standard today? Right? Was the inspection result recorded? That's nice it was recorded, but it's the right action taken is what I might be more important, might be more concerned about. Here are just a few sample questions that, uh, that, that are more specific, they're objective, that they get to the heart of the matter for a particular workstation. Let's just look at uh, maybe uh, two of them. Are all operators in the cell wearing eye and ear protection? So with specific eye and ear protection, you could observe, you can look at the operators in the area and say yes or no. Right. Uh, the last one, does the temperature readout for the adhesive show a value that's between this lower bound and this upper bound? Right. These are just sample. You'd want to make them specific for your operation. Another caution is don't just have the quality function be your shepherd in facilitating layered process audits. If it's only the quality department that's writing the questions, they're limited in understanding what's most important in that job. So even if you have someone in quality that's really, really smart, worked in many jobs in your facility and well-respected, you still want to have multiple sets of eyes exploring what questions to ask in the precious few minutes where you're conducting these layered verifications. I was told many years ago when my kids were younger that you wanna you know, teach them to always avoid saying always, right? You always give my favorite to the other person, right? And to say, uh, never use never, right? You never treat me to ice cream, right? That's not true, that's an exaggeration. Well, in layered verifications, we always want to avoid these four words, right? Is the temperature setting correct? Great question. I'd love the answer to be yes, but as a layered process verification auditor, how would I know what correct is? I need to see the standard when I'm conducting that audit, right? Um, is the operator setting up the job properly? What does properly mean, right? So, a good way to test that is to ask the operator, hey, I'm not really sure what this means. What is the proper way to load the part? And then stop and listen. Write a couple notes because the operators know it just wasn't evolved into the question. The second step of the three we're talking about today is about engagement. And that deals with the auditor or the verifier engaging with the person that's doing the work. So much of what happens in your facilities is people dependent, even with automation, even with cloud computing and data, automated gauging, people make the whole system run. So it's important to make eye contact, to show sincerity, and really dig to the matter that the question is leading you to.
in an audit, you might be measuring something or, or counting something. And LPA is not like counting bolts, right? It deals with people. So we want to go see, we want to ask what's going on, maybe why. We want to show respect because that person, if you're auditing something that's on an LPA, that must be important to quality. So we want to respect the individual that has that responsibility, regardless of their role in the organization or their rank or their seniority. They're doing something critical to quality. We want to respect that. Our job is to ensure things are going right, right? My third bullet point here, I'm here to make sure things are going right for you as the operator and for us as an organization. Remember, the things you put on an LPA are the things that are most critical to the organization. So we want to take the time to verify. One of my mentors taught me a great way to explain LPA. We're not trying to catch something wrong. We're not trying to find problems. We want to catch something, someone doing something right, right? And acknowledge that. And that drives a lot of behavior change. We want to explain the why, especially if the, the work isn't performed according to the standard. The why should be part of the question. Again, the, the ESTOL, which I'm familiar with, Beacon Quality, allows you to structure the question so that you have the specific objective piece you're looking for, an explanation of why, and the reaction plan. So utilize that why, because a teaching moment to let the team member, operator, technician say, you know, temperature was off a little bit, here's why it's important, now here's what we need to do to correct that. The auditor's role is not just to go through and check off a box. We want the auditor to be an interested observer, see what's going on. You're doing an important job for the organization when you are the verifier conducting questions. We used to say that the symbol was a, a clipboard. You go out with a clipboard, not hiding behind a piece of equipment to find things, but to interact with operators. Now that symbol might be uh, a clipboard or it might be a vest or it might be a tablet with some software loaded on it. But your job at that moment is your regular nine to five job or 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. job, but you're currently a verifier. You wanna see if the process is working right. You wanna find out what's not working. Again, these are the questions or the elements that are most important to the organization. So if it's not working well, it's not, well, we'll wait. No, we wanna fix it in cycle. We wanna trigger immediate fixes. We might look for what else is different. Be the eyes and ears of curiosity. Well, geez, it doesn't show that you're using that tool that uh, it's a different tool than is mentioned in the work instruction. Or um, I see the picture that I, that I call up in, in, the, in our audit um, doesn't match the, the tag you have. Why is that? What's going on? Or hey, I see that there's some scrap here today. What's gone wrong? What, what could we be doing better? So the auditor's role is to engage show respect and concern that the job is done right the first time. When there are problems, we wanna to react to problems quickly. Uh, it's great if you're using software that will allow you to call up a picture or to take a picture of the situation and automatically alert the right people. So we wanna record the nonconformance, trigger the reaction plan as the auditor or the verifier my job isn't to fix it, but it's to contact the right people that have the authority, have the knowledge to trigger countermeasures, start the problem solving, correct the situation. By the way, while I'm talking here and flipping through slides, I hope that maybe you're taking some notes and if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the question box and uh, at the appropriate time, Rachel will interrupt me and we'll talk about questions. So the third step is when you're ready to turn the corner. If you have standards in place and now you're verifying them, and now you have auditors that are going out and engaging with the people doing the work, reinforcing, then you're really ready to accelerate your efforts towards excellence by developing a culture of quality. Easy to say, hard to quantify, but when I'm in organizations where there is a culture of quality, you could feel it. 
you could tell in the way that people react to work, in the way people treat each other, in the way leadership is engaged with the work going on today, as well as looking out how things can be different in the future. How do you get there? Well, a little hard to tell you that in, uh, in a one-hour webinar, but I'd like to share some of the things that I've seen, that I've worked with some of my clients. Um, some of this was learned the hard way. Some organizations, it's harder than others. Here's some things that you could take away, maybe take back to your leadership groups and share that. Uh, my first bullet point here is auditors are the face of management. So for this brief moment of time where you're doing an audit of molding line A, even if you're a supervisor, at that moment in time, you're the face of top management. You're saying quality is important, and I'm here to help you as an operator because when quality is wrong, it's expensive for all of us. If I see there's a problem, I want, to, I want to lead by example. I want to react quickly to any problems, just like you would expect top management to. I can't reinforce again, the things that are on a layered process verification are the top triangle, right? The tip of the iceberg, the most important visible problems that you want to avoid. If we see a problem there, something's not conforming, operator's doing the wrong way, the setting's wrong, the output isn't coming out right, we want to react quickly to those problems. Because of this responsiveness, people should want to be audited. Right? Audit me. Make sure I'm doing it right. If there's a problem, I, I trust that you're not going to blame me, but you're going to help us get to the bottom so that things can be right every time. Similarly, because it's a, it's a high-impact, well-respected role, auditors should want to verify. They shouldn't want to skip their schedule. They wouldn't say, oh, I've got this meeting, I've got something else to do. Auditors should want to verify. Now, if you're not having that, maybe we should talk offline, but key reasons might be that the questions aren't effective, that you have too many questions on the check sheet, that they're hard to understand, like a scavenger hunt, Another one is that your top leader isn't doing audits because they haven't seen the value yet. And if my top leader is not doing the audit, they're not reinforcing me for doing the audit. So I probably will eventually stop doing the audits. People respect what you inspect. Great statement. Right? This is what we use with a, a major rollout with an OEM. People respect what you inspect. If you're checking the work standards, if you're checking the setups, if you're checking whether or not someone within your organization did their layered audits, people understand what's important. Okay? Consistency is really important. Consistency and holding people accountable. That's what develops the culture. You can't just have one good day because everyone did their audit and you corrected problems. Every day you have to have that same mentality. And if you get good at it, you're gonna find that more often you're preventing problems because you are holding those standards in place. And the fewer times where you're having issues, you're correcting them right away. Developing a culture of excellence, a culture of quality, requires many sets of eyes. You can't do it alone if you're the operator, if you're a team member, if you're a supervisor, if you're the plant manager, if you're the president. No one person can drive quality alone. We're all in this together. Everyone is responsible for quality. So we want to look out for each other. And that's, in a way, what a layered audit is. It does it in a very structured, disciplined way, because you have questions that are asked on schedule. But basically, we're peering into each other's work environment and saying, hey, is it going OK? Let me be your double checker, because you don't want to have a problem. I don't want to have a problem. We could look out for each other. And when we prevent things from going wrong, we all benefit, right? We all benefit when things go well. Verification with intentions, right? If I know that my manager cares, then I'm going to care. What a great way to show that you care by checking and giving feedback, right? Catch someone doing something right, give feedback. Ask with a smile. We're not out to find problems. We're not out to interrogate. We want people to open up. You could use your LPAs not just to verify what's in place, but to solicit continuous improvement. Everything went well. Your audit went a little quicker than it did maybe last week. 
why not ask the operator or the team member or associate, hey, really appreciate things are going well here. Let me ask you, we have a couple of minutes. What are your ideas? How can we make this job more efficient? How can we make it more effective? How would you train your replacement? And stop and listen. Right? That helps create a culture of excellence. People know you care, you're consistent, you hold people accountable whenever you're not conforming, and you hold people accountable to follow the standard. It goes back to verification and engagement. When you use um, a, a tool, and I'm gonna go back to the Beacon software that I'm familiar with, that helps free you up to not worry about paperwork and checklists and how are you gonna make sure that unconformance gets to the right person. So when you're ready to evolve from a paper-based system, automation does allow you to leverage it even further because you're not worried about the mechanics of the audit. It allows you to create eye contact, to solicit information, make sure that information goes to the right place. So we like that. Right? We want to make it easy. A layered audit should not be viewed as a requirement. If your leadership understands these three steps of verification to the standard, engage with the people that are doing the work and driving a culture of excellence, it's going to make work easier and will make continuous improvement easier. A couple things I'd like you to take away from that are important to make it a habit. So if you're layered audits, if you're, you're missing layered audits, if you're not doing audits every day, every shift in a production area, a non-production area, maybe a little less frequently, consider ramping that up. If it's a problem ramping it up, think about reducing the number of items that you check. Check the very few that make the biggest difference. Top leadership must verify. Right? There's no way that you could hold in place the habit and consistency and accountability if top leadership, whoever that is in your facility, if they're not doing the audits, role modeling the behaviors of others. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it drives a huge amount of benefit by preventing problems. Use technology. You don't want this to be another job Someone have to print off check sheets, they enter the data, send reports out. That becomes quite a burden, right? Here we are, 2018. So find tools. There are plenty of tools out there to automate layered process verifications. And the last one here is action, right? Act to make quality happen. Without action, it's just a banner on the wall, right? Quality is job one. Uh, we respect quality. Quality is objective. If it's a banner on the wall, people forget about it after a few hours. Okay. So in summary, uh, we talked about verification, engagement, uh, cultural quality. Uh, I really appreciate your time. We'll, we'll, we'll take your questions in a second, but some key things I'd like you to take away. One is you must have meaningful questions. They shouldn't be generic. They should not be vague. For engagement, you want to act, you want to be an observer and react. Right? React positively to reinforce the behaviors that should be in place and bring in countermeasures, correct situations, show people that we care. We're not going to allow something to go on for hours or days or weeks that should be conforming that aren't. Right? So we're going to maintain equipment, we're going to buy supplies, we're going to give people PPE. Catch people doing something right, right? and trigger meaningful reactions whenever something is wrong. For cultural quality, I'd like you to go away with thinking about consistency of verification is what drives improvement. Show respect, show you care, and by doing that, you're holding everyone accountable, not just people that maybe made an error periodically, but holding everyone accountable. So Rachel, that's uh, what I got for today. I, I hope it's helpful, and if we still have time, could we take some um, questions? Yeah, certainly. So we, we have a few questions. Um, the first is, how long should it take to, to complete an LPA check of one area? Oh, okay, good question. Well, I'm going to give you a guideline of 10 to 15 minutes, but it's going to depend on risk. So if it's a highly automated area where there's not a lot of chance for variation, then maybe on that smaller end of that. 
maybe even much smaller, maybe two to five minutes. On the other hand, if it's a area that relies a lot on human behavior, on decisions, where maybe the work is more complex, then I would go a little longer. Maybe it's uh, 20 minutes because there's a lot more to check, a lot more that's at risk. If you find your audits are getting closer to 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it might be a flag that we have too much risk in the process. And rather than investing LPA time over and over again, let's invest some engineering time to take risk out, to automate, to better control, to error-proof, things like that. Great. Um, Michael here asks a question. You mentioned uh, warranty improvements as a benefit. Uh, how is LPAs associated with warranty? Well, warranty might come from a design issue or could come from a manufacturing problem. Um, and so that's a, that's, that's a good question because a lot of my examples have been talking about LPA within manufacturing. But anywhere that you have a defined process, you could apply layered process audits. So we're doing that with some clients with uh, FMEA reviews. So they're essentially doing a layered audit. They're checking uh, five to 10 key elements of a failure mode effects analysis, the right team, multiple causes selected, were the scale used appropriately. So multiple sets of eyes check that. And the intent there is by identifying risk up front and controlling them in the design, it would reduce launch issues and warranty issues. In the manufacturing world, um, sometimes manufacturing defects slip out because controls weren't held in place, final audits weren't done, people weren't doing their checks, and again, layered audits could help you find those problems earlier rather than them going out to the field and causing warranty issues. Great. And before I get to the next question, I just wanted to say that we uh, Beacon Quality uh, will be having an offer uh, it's an iPad giveaway. So I, I do want to let you guys know that we are going to be sharing that in just a few minutes, but I wanted to make sure we got to your questions first. Uh, so Laura here asks, when, when you say to react to questions quickly, is this for the individual auditors or is this for the person who coordinates the LPA process? Well, first for the person that's conducting the verification. So um, I'm working on, uh, I'm doing an audit of an assembly line, and I find that uh, the wrong part tote has brought, been brought to the line, and maybe for the last two hours, we're, we're building product with, with the wrong um, variation. So um, I want to, I observe that. I want to trigger some reaction. Now, I might not have the authority as an auditor to stop the line, but that would be my goal, is in cycle to not prevent one more assembly to be built with the wrong subcomponent. So my job is say, point it out to the operator or the technician and get the supervisor over there and let them, let them react. Now, if that problem is found the next day, that, that same auditor might not be the one to see it, then it might go to the site coordinator or maybe you have your software trigger repeat issues, you know, two repeats within a week, whatever your your scheme is, and then that would boil up that way. Okay. But primarily, catch it in source and trigger a reaction with the right people. Generally, that's a supervisor. If there's a follow-up, was that Laura? You're fine to give me a follow-up question, and uh, I'll try my best. Okay. I'll, I'll check to see if she if she asks another question. Um, okay. And next question is: uh, Should the list of uh, this is from Deepak? Uh, should the list of questions or, or checklists should it be different for the different layers of management? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, yes and no. They don't have to be. Um, so, at a base level, the idea of verification with many sets of eyes is the same people are going to check the same things. So if I am a supervisor and I know the plant manager is going to be checking the speeds and feeds, I'm definitely going to check the speeds and feeds because I don't want her or him to find something that I should have checked. Okay, so base the same. Some organizations, because the frequency of audits is lower for higher levels, so you might have a plant manager that's not doing an audit every day, but maybe once a week, 
Um, maybe in addition to the core questions for that area, they're going to check some other things. Uh, classically, they might check some things related to the quality system calibration. I'm not a big fan of that because you should have another system to do that. Um, classically, they might be checking safety. I like that, right? That reinforces a culture of safety. They might be checking 5S, workplace organization. That's kind of sandwiching a couple things together. But if it's important and if it's valuable, you could do that as well. Okay. And and we have uh, quite a few questions regarding the length of the LPA. So, like, how many questions is enough or how many is too much? And then how often hmm. should uh, those questions actually be changed? Okay. Well, so a number of questions, maybe not as important as the time, right? If you're out there for less than a minute, are you really checking things? And if you're out there for more than 20 minutes, that's a long time. So if they're very quick checks, maybe you have 20 things you're checking. I personally think that's a lot. Uh, if I was a, a verifier and I called up, you know, in the app, my, my questions for today, I think I'd rather answer five to seven. I make my life easy. There's a lot going on. Um, when you're doing a paper-based system, a little bit more difficult to randomize questions, but that's a nice thing to do too. So you, let's just say you're shooting for five questions. Maybe three of them are the top risk issues related to customer spills, related to downtime, related to safety. And while well, I'm gonna pound away at those questions because if I stop asking or checking those things, big issue. Then maybe the other two questions I'm gonna randomize. Maybe I'll do a 5S question. Maybe I'll randomize a question to pop up once a month that might be related to something we think we solved. We want to make sure we hold them in place. I'm not going to invest the time every day, but periodically I would. Um, I think there was a third part to your question, Rachel. Uh, how how often it? to change the questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. How often to change the questions? Well, uh, you know, some of my answers, you know, aren't black and white because it depends on the organization. Uh, so the question shouldn't be static. As you have new risk, you add to them. The question is, when do you take questions off? Well, if you have more than seven, if it's more than 20 minutes, now you might have to prioritize. Here's a caution. If you put something on a layered audit and it was launched like that, so... You know, I'm going to use for TPAP, right? Production approval that was signed off by the customer. That this is what you're going to check. And you decide to take that question off. Go to your customer first. Maybe use data. Explain why you want to take it off. You want your layered process verification to be effective. You got some clutter in there. Here's why you believe that's under control. So share that responsibility before you take it off. Uh, other than that, you know, kind of keep it fresh. When you have maybe new operators, that might be a chance. Um, doesn't is you don't need to update your layered audit questions every month. Maybe rotate across the plant. So once a quarter, you're you're getting a quarter of all the LPA check sheets and making sure they make sense. Not by one person testing that, but by a, a cross-functional group, operations or engineering, whoever's responsible. Maybe quality, uh, maybe a facilitator, internal or external, for a fresh set of eyes. And one one of the great things with Beacon Quality is you can have these um, randomized questions. So if you have a certain area that you want questions to periodically show up in the LPA, you can have that kind of randomized or um, rotation of questions so that you know that a certain amount of questions are always being asked, but maybe not all the time. Exactly right. And also pictures help too. That's a good way to keep uh, keep them fresh and your comment Rachel reminded me right because your software has the ability to add photos not just of the as it should be so you could compare that with reality but you could also use your smartphone and take a picture of this is what I observed right this is the condition when I saw it to prove that it was conforming or to show that it was non-conforming and that some action needs to be taken exactly um so how much training, uh, Lou's asking about training uh, of uh, for the auditors. So how much do they need to be trained on how to conduct the, the layer process audit? Not a lot. 
So when people talk about auditors, they often think about their quality system auditors, like an aerospace um, AS9 D100 or Autos automotive IATF auditors. Those require specific training and practice and training records. You don't need to have much in-depth training. They need to read. They need to be you know, read the question. They need to be able to interact with people. They need to be able to make a decision, but there's no extensive training. Uh, the best training I like is to role model. You follow me, I'll show you how you do it. Then you do it, I'll follow you, I'll give you some feedback, and then we'll create a training record and say, you know, you know how to use the software, or you know how to find the sheet, you need to conduct an audit, and you're good to go. Um, the second section of the short presentation for those that are going to, you know, download it, the idea of engagement, that's, that's a real important piece of what an auditor needs to understand. You're not counting bolts. You're not just checking off yes, 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 right? You want to engage, you want to observe, you want to help facilitate the trigger response when there's a problem, and you want to show sincerity, right? So it's really more uh, human behavior skills than technical skills. So okay. I think one, <laughs> one question um, that I, I see a, a quite a few times here is, the fear of asking questions that could jeopardize somebody's job. So uh, he, here's Joanne asking, uh, if I ask the operator how we can help your replacement, would, oh, how would we replace your replacement? Would it create fear, basically? So I, I know you talked a lot about respect and um, how to phrase what you're doing there. Um, Maybe just restate yeah, that or, or worry, you know, kind of help with the, what would you say to someone that's worried that they might lose their job if, some, if they found something wrong? Right. So, Joanne, I'm not sure if your question was triggered by the example I gave where I said, you know, you have a little extra time, continuous improvement, how would you train, how would you train your replacement, or if it was a different thing. But what I was saying is, hey, we're a culture where, we're, we're growing as an organization. Our people are growing. If you're in this job this year, next year we'd like you to take on more responsibility. Or once you master this, we're going to move you somewhere else. So it's job growth. It's challenging. And to do that successfully, you have to backfill people. So that was my intent. Is in a quality of culture, um, people are not worried about their job. They expect to grow and help their replacement. So that's one regard. But if the question is, on the other hand, people are afraid you're going to find problems, that you know their job's at risk if you're checking them, then it requires explanation. Why are we doing this audit? Right? We weren't doing it last year. Now we're doing these things called layered audits. Um, yeah, our customer exposes to us. Uh, they say we need to do that. But we've learned about it. We're going to do a pilot area. We believe this is going to help us. And the help us will be in less scrap, less downtime, things will be right the first time. You as an operator will get what you need. If there's a, a problem on the machine or with materials, we're gonna to respond to that. So by following through with that, you'll break through maybe that fear of something different, right? Not calling an audit, but a verification. Uh, it's not just their boss that's doing the check. It's not quality doing the only person doing the check. People see, and yeah, this. You know, if we're catching problems earlier, that saves us money. We maybe gain more market share. That's what you want to focus on: the end metrics that everyone sees, not just the financial numbers that go to shareholders or owners. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think so. Um, so there's a question here regarding mitigations. So what is, uh, from Sean, what is the protocol for assigning mitigation plans to fellow employees? Um, he's specifically finding all the mitigations are assigned to the supervisors of the area. Hmm. Well, that surprises me a little bit because I would think that the supervisor, if that's the trigger event, is the, the verifier or auditor calls the supervisor and say, hey, we, we got an issue. Um, and then you got to think about, gosh, there's so many different types of problems that could be found. Um, so it's something only within the, the span of control of the supervisor, then maybe it would be. But if it requires 
maybe tooling, maybe an update to a, um, a test protocol, um, galaxy maintenance involved, metrology involved, maybe materials involved, that I wouldn't, definitely wouldn't want it all be on the, the shoulder of a supervisor. Uh, if it's a classic example of operator was not following the instruction, the answer isn't training because obviously that didn't work the first time and that's not very robust. So maybe engineering needs to be involved in how do we simplify the job? Or maybe if you have a, uh, like an operational excellence department, what can we do in terms of visual management, cues, um, segregating non-conforming from conforming so this kind of mistake is less likely. But so I think about changing the work and that requires more than the supervisor. Great. So um, there's one question here, or actually uh, a number of you have asked about uh, sharing a LPA basic checklist. And that is something that we are uh, currently working on that will be a downloadable PDF example of an LPA. Um, but just a reminder, the LPAs are supposed to be specific to your plant and, and your processes. Um, but we will be creating a sample checklist to, for you guys to have soon. Um, right. question I mean, as someone in the industry, I've seen a lot more checklists that need improvement than you know, great examples. Um, mm. But try to use some of the guidelines I suggested about being specific, objective, uh, what's important in that job. Don't say correctly. What does correctly mean? You know, give a, give a uh, descriptor or quantify uh, or something that could be read and compared to the, re the app the desired state. Great. And yeah, so is there one more question, Rich? One one last question here. Um, and I think it's an important one. Uh, we have an issue with buy-in for from our auditors and, and we've seen this too. Um, it seems as though it's just a check in the box and not a tool used for continuous improvement. And how does a company get their auditors to, to buy into this? Mm -hmm. Well, my first thought is um, I hope your plant manager or head of operations was on this webinar to understand that verification is just the first step. Right? And that could seem like a clerical administrative activity and no one wants to do that. So you gotta make sure those questions are targeted and holding the right way in place based on risk. We wanna be very respectful, not just of the operators who are doing the check, but auditor's time. So if the questions aren't meaningful, right, is the operator following work instructions? Was the job set up properly? I can't check that. I'm just going to check the box and say, yeah, it's fine, so I can get on with my work. But if you make the questions meaningful and people understand the why, what if the speed was wrong? What if we have the wrong polymer loaded? What if we're not handling it with the right tool? Okay. If the impact is nothing, it shouldn't be on there. But if the impact is, this was why we had our major customer issue in 2017, well, I wanna make sure that fix was in place. In fact, everyone would wanna make sure that fix was in place. So I think you need to do a little soul, soul searching on your questions on who's doing the checks and if they understand why you're doing these verifications. You wanna engage, you wanna set a culture of quality. It's not just to fill out a form. The form is just the job aid. Perfect. Great answer. Well, thank you again, uh, Murray, uh, for being with us today. Um, I, I, so many people have said thank you so much. They're excited to share this recording with their team. Um, I know a lot of you hey, ask questions. My, that My pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad. I love talking about this topic and related topics. So you know, feel free to you know throw in more questions and a blog. It's a great idea, Rachel. Yeah, because I, I think we got to maybe half of the questions today. Um, so we will be, re I do have a record of all of your questions. We will be getting to all of them. Um, take note of that bit.ly link if you do want to sign up for a free trial. And uh, thank you so much. A recording will be sent to all of you as well as the slide deck. So thank you again, Marie Sisamar from Luminous Group for being here today. Thanks, Rachel. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Bye, everyone.